Hear the word of God from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This reading comes from the Common English Bible. You can find it also on page 97 in the Pew Bible. Therefore, since we have been righteous, made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him. And we boast in the image of the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope does not put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. While we were still weak at the right moment, Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now that we have been made righteous by his blood, we can be even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. If we were reconciled to God through the death of his son while we were still enemies, now that we have been reconciled, how much more certain is it that we will be saved by his life? And not only that, we even take pride in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom we now have a restored relationship with God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we continue in our series of different theories of atonement, I, well, we're going to look at the appeasement or satisfaction theory of atonement today. Um, but I wanted to bring a reminder of why we're looking at all of these things. I brought my toolbox so that I could give you a visual. And in my toolbox today, I have some wrenches, if I can get it to open. <laughs> there we go. That tells you how old it is. Uh, apparently, the crescent wrench is my favorite because I have three different sizes in a variety of brands. I also have this uh, channel lock uh, wrench. This one's really very handy, although it's not really my favorite. My favorite one, I have to say, is the vice grip because once you get this one down and gripped on whatever you want, it is not going anywhere. And then, of course, when you have plumbing problems, this one always helps out the wonderful pipe wrench. Now, I brought all these wrenches because they're sort of like the theories of atonement. There's a different wrench that you use for different settings. You use them for different purposes. They look different. They have the same function, but you can't use the pipe wrench when you really need a crescent wrench. It often doesn't fit in that spot, and so on. And it's the same thing with our theories of atonement that each one of them takes a different, little bit different look at atonement, or what we might call at one if we break up the word differently, where Jesus helps make us one with God. And so, as we've gone through these weeks, there are some of these theories that you connect to very much, and some that maybe you don't quite so much. But all of them can give you clues to things that perhaps you haven't connected to in your relationship with Christ or ways that you might want to examine. God made us and he brought about our reconciliation. And so as we talk about atonement, Let's always remember that it is something real that happened on the cross. It is something for us that happened on the cross. And that's why it's so important. No idea is sufficient to describe it all. But they all help us understand why Jesus died. Will you pray with me, please? 
Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. Help me to get out of the way. That regardless of the words that I say, that your message will be clearly received by each of us. Because we are each looking to take our next faithful step in our journey with you. Amen. Well, as you can imagine, when we're talking about appeasement or satisfaction, which means turning away the wrath of God, it may not be the number one sermon topic for many people. Besides the simple discomfort of thinking about what that wrath looks like and why it might come about, there's this sense that if we look at it too long, we'll find that we are the ones at which it is aimed. But God's wrath isn't exactly what we might believe it is. We tend to think, as I have always thought, of wrath as being this out-of-control, over-the-top anger aimed at vengeance. Well, you know, those are human emotions that happen, and that may be the way that human wrath is expressed. But when we talk about God... Wrath is more like a settled hostility toward those things that separate us from him and from each other. It's, in other words, sin. It's a settled hostility because it doesn't come out of an emotional reaction on God's part, but it comes out of his character of who he is. Because in himself, he does not need to make a decision it is because of his holiness that it cannot and will not bear with that which is not holy or righteous. Not because of his anger, but because he wants to extend his mercy and his loving kindness. Now this theory was from the early Christian theologian Anselm. And it's often interpreted as the appeasement of God's wrath or turning away of God's wrath through the death of Jesus Christ. It's very similar to the substitution theory we talked about way at the beginning. However, the difference is that in substitution, we are maintaining God's honor. That that's what happens in, God's, in Christ's death is that it helps set us right with God's offended honor. Versus in satisfaction or appeasement, it is that God requires the death of Christ so that it will turn away his wrath from us, his hostility, that settled hostility. But he's not angry in that vengeful way that we tend to... Uh, Think of him as we try to make him more like us and more like humans and how we would react. I thought God was angry with me while I was expecting our oldest child, Catherine. I had spent the first few weeks since finding out that I was pregnant fearful of God, of what he might do to me or to the child. Now, some of you have heard me say before, in my elementary and middle school years, I attended a free will Baptist church with a neighbor where every week it was a sermon of hellfire and damnation and brimstone and all of that. So I was steeped in a sort of fundamental idea that if I did wrong, I got punished. And somewhat had this thought uh, that is communicated by Jonathan Edwards, an 18th century revivalist preacher. In his sermon, A Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God, he shares this visual. Thus it is that, the natural, that natural men, meaning those who are separated from God, have not yet found their way there or have turned away, are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell, 
They deserve the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those who are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell. They have done nothing in the least to appease or to abate the anger. Neither is God in the least way bound by the promise to hold them up one moment. It's a frightening way to think about God. The power of that understanding of God's wrath would end up being enough to grieve me for most of the rest of the pregnancy. So when I started spotting just three months along, I was overcome with fear, mostly fear of God's anger. I know it sounds like a weird response, doesn't it? I mean, you're happy when you're pregnant. Except you'd have to know that when I was 16, I had an abortion. From then on, I spent time wandering in the desert, a good long time. I never stopped loving Jesus or praying, but I wasn't part of a church and I wasn't seeking to draw near. I was afraid. When I was pregnant with Catherine, I was just taking my first steps back to God and the church, but I thought he was very angry with me, angry enough that he might take this child in payment for what I had done. Now, understanding grace, had I understood it, perhaps that fear would not have been there. But maybe you've been there too. Feeling like God is angry with you. You know, sometimes it happens when you have a challenge and then another challenge and they keep mounting up and things just don't seem to be going right and soon you find yourself telling your friends, I think God's mad at me. Or you go to your pastor and you say, can you help me figure out why God hates me? Can you help me figure out what I've done that has made all of these things happen? In the classical expression of today's atonement theory, God's wrath is saved for those who are separated from, from him. But that does not prevent any person, person of faith or not, from feeling sometimes that, excuse me, God is angry. So if that's so, how is it that we can feel condemned at odds with God, victim of divine anger, the cause of which we cannot identify? I found myself having difficulty accepting God's forgiveness. I couldn't believe that he would want to. There was this divide between me and God. Shame and guilt an embarrassment. They were my good friends. I couldn't imagine life without them. And so add that, add to that, this veil of silence that I'd put over what I'd done as a teenager, and I felt adrift from God. And now to feel that he was angry with me, it was almost too much to bear. And that's one of the downsides or cons and when we do pro and con of this theory of atonement, the prospect of God's wrath, which is designed to drive us toward him, to drive us toward the forgiveness that he offers, instead can push us back, make us step away and open the chasm even further than it was before. So... And then, you know, sometimes there's that thought with each of these of how could God require the death of an innocent for the guilty? In fact, why was this violence necessary at all? Well, as it turns out, if you look through much of human history, the idea of one person or a small group 
being sacrificed or sent from the community by the remainder of the community as a scapegoat it occurs over and over again. It's part of human experience. It even has a special name, sacrificial scapegoating. A community or group of communities that are in disarray, perhaps experiencing violence, that have disunity, decides that who the culprit is, and they all aim their thoughts toward that person or group. And the push comes to finally eliminate that person, to send them from the community, to exile them, to kill them. And in the unity that they gain in all gathering around this idea, then it's proof that, of course, the one that they had cast aside was the culprit. The victim, though, becomes invisible in this way because oftentimes afterward, the victim is recast into this person who was sacrificed because they were created to be. That, or that they had some kind of supernatural power, or that in some other way, this, the victim, was the bringer of peace. And so when this happens, the victim disappears, having become the hero. And the injustice of the community, which often accuses someone who's innocent, also disappears. We see this in the Israelites often, so many different alliances that were made against other people, the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. We even see it in Jesus' death. When the Herodians and the Pharisees who were enemies colluded to be able to get rid of their now common enemy and the threat he had become. Now, the upside of this theory of atonement is that it's very much like a legal drama. There is right, there is wrong, there's the end of the wrong, namely the scapegoat. The downside is the victim and the injustice that we no longer see in the way the story is told. Theologian S. Mark Heim has proposed that if we made this one minor change to Anselm's theory of atonement, that it may read more like what has happened. That God did not pit himself against himself in God requiring Jesus to die, but that perhaps God and Jesus worked together, came together for this to happen, this sacrificial scapegoating to happen one last time to end it for all time. It means the victim is obvious. We've never forgotten Jesus. And the injustice becomes visible too. But even with that change, the effect is still the same, that we are made right through the death of Jesus, through the blood that is shed. So as we ponder whether God is angry with us, consider that wrath, as it's communicated in the New Testament, is a future event. Paul clearly says it in this part of our passage. So now that we have been made righteous by his blood, meaning Jesus, we can be even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. If we were reconciled to God through the death of his son while we were still enemies, now that we've been reconciled, how much more certain is it that we will be saved by his life? As those reconciled by God or to God by grace through faith, there is no wrath to come because of Christ's work on the cross that we have faith in. Regardless of which connects to you more, it does not resolve for us the simple truth that the idea of God's wrath simply sets us on edge. 
We understand and want a loving God, of whom Paul says in our passage, but God shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We say that in our communion liturgy. We cannot simply sidestep God's wrath, for it is present in the Old and New Testaments. And the Old Testament often extended toward Israel for their failure to turn toward God and their continual turning away. But in the New Testament is what our founder John Wesley called the wrath to come. God's wrath is exclusively referenced as a future punishment for sin in refusing to trust our Creator and love the neighbor. Sin at its heart is a matter of injustice toward God and our desire to follow our own way and toward others in similar selfishness to get what we want. In light of that, God's wrath may be more properly viewed as aimed at the underlying injustice and evil and oppression that characterizes the human condition rather than any one of us individually. I stopped believing God was mad at me toward the end of my pregnancy, though it took a couple more years for me to accept the forgiveness for what I thought had clearly separated me from Him. I began to understand grace. And here's what I found. He had been waiting for me all those years, waiting for me to let my guard down, to let him in. I experienced not anger from him, but literally light and life, release from shame and guilt and embarrassment, and the sweetest sense of God's love in Jesus. Friends, God is not mad at you. He is waiting for you, waiting for you to let him into all those places that you hide from him, all those places that you hide from yourself, the places you don't want to acknowledge. Let him in. Let him into all the nooks and the crannies. Don't keep him waiting out on the porch. Let him into the living room and the kitchen and the bedroom and even the closet, the junk drawer, every place. He's waiting, waiting to come in. To, so let him give you the peace that you've been longing for. Hear me well, God's not mad at you bow our heads. Oh, holy God, how grateful we are. How grateful that however we perceive these theories of atonement, however we come to understand you, that you desire relationship with us desired it so much that through Jesus Christ you made the way for us to have peace, to be forgiven, to be saved for you, saved by your grace, by faith in you. Lord God, help us. Help us let you in to all those places in our lives where you would be. To every place of pain, every place of anguish, every one of which you can heal, you will heal. You have made that way for us, Lord. Help us take hold of it. Strengthen us. Love us. Help us know your love. 
in a way we never have before. In the name of Jesus, amen. As part of our continuing of worship, we'll be receiving a morning offering where we have opportunity to bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, our very selves to God. When we can return to Him a portion of all that He has given to us. <laughs> 